Hello everyone, I'm Linda Bennett, your spiritual counselor and psychic host for Metaphysically Speaking. We're coming to you today with a whole bunch of questions I've been getting on the emails and all kinds of things you've been sending in, letters, phone calls, and this is going to be kind of a general information show. Now for people who are new to Metaphysically Speaking, what's it all about? Well, Aristotle defined metaphysics as the unseen world. Years ago in meditation, I was given the term metaphysically speaking to indicate that we're bringing the unseen world and the seen world together. Because if you're in a physical body, you have to be able to see the physical world. But if you are extra special and you meditate and you do good things and you make Santa's nice list every year, then hopefully you will be able to see part of the astral world. This little critter that's looking to jump on the table is my sidekick little Princess Gracious Gracie, and she will be in and out of the camera shots as we go. Anybody who has a cat understands you don't tell them what to do, they let you know what to do. So don't be alarmed. The setup here looks a little busy because so many people have said to me, how do I begin to meditate? What's it all about? Where can I do it? And we're going to do a short little segment, not the whole show. So if you're not going to meditate, don't worry about it, but you can tell someone about it. Now you can catch us on YouTube, metaspeak.com on Facebook and blog talk radio. And did I forget anything? No. Okay. So it's metaspeak, M-E-T-A-S-P-E-A-K.com. Alrighty. Now I am a yogi. What does a yogi mean? A yogi means that you can go to God in any way. I was raised Catholic, fought with the nuns and the priests my whole life, finally gave up, studied Judaism, didn't care for Judaism, went to Lutheranism, didn't care for that, went to Method Methodist Church, didn't care for that. I think I covered just about everything in my part of Long Island. So meanwhile, I had been having all kinds of metaphysical experiences and angels and little fairies in the yard and the forest one day when I got lost, and I realized that the universe was a lot bigger than somebody's religion. Remember, religion is man-made. Somebody made it up and decided that you and I should follow all of its directives. And if you're really good, you may go to heaven. If not, your soul will be lost forever. That's nonsense. Spirituality is universal. It's good here on this planet. It's good anywhere else. Spirituality is the understanding of the God force, why we're here, what we really are. I love Oprah Winfrey and Deepak Chopra's expression that we are souls having a human experience. I was at my veterinarian's yesterday and I was explaining to the one of the girls who was taking care of a parrot who was a very emotional parrot and they couldn't figure out why the parrot was so emotional. And if anybody knows anything about birds, you know that the birds pluck their feathers out when they're really stressed. Well, about a year ago, this bird looked like it was completely defeathered except for its head. So Toby has really brought this bird back. But as I was looking at the bird and talking to the bird, I said, wait a minute, this bird is an empath. She said, what's that? I said, that's somebody, whether it's a person, an animal, who experiences other people's emotions and feelings and fears. And this little critter does it for animals as well as for people. So she said, well, that makes sense because when I'm upset, it wants to climb on my shoulder and do little kissies. And if my daughter's upset, he'll sit down with my daughter. And she said, oh, that really makes sense. And she said, when we have surgeries here and something's going wrong, he knows it immediately. I said, it's so much emotion. I said, it's overwhelming. They have stress out in the wild. Am I going to get a berry on this bush? Am I going to be able to nest over here in this tree? But this is more than parrots are genetically programmed to deal with. So that's what's making him so nervous. As I'm telling her this, the bird is eyeing me. You know, they have their eyes on each side of their head and eyeing me and calming down and calming down. So I told her to do some chakra balancing, which I'll explain to you in a minute after I explain the altar, and to stroke the bird gently when she knows it's upset. All animals are empaths. 
Many people are empaths. If you're someone who picks up on a lot of emotions, and I don't mean people who love drama, I mean people who can sense when somebody else is upset, then you are an empath. And you have to be careful to understand the difference between your upsetment and somebody else's upsetment. And so what do you do? You just ask God and the angels to send them a little light. You ask them to send them a blessing. And you send a little light to that person, visualize the person in a white beam. And very often, that'll calm this situation down. Now, when we talk about different topics here, I know that there are some people who might be offended. And if you are, listen anyway. You're going to learn something. You may agree, you may disagree, doesn't matter. Years ago, I lectured at St. Pete College, and it was a theology class, a theology and philosophy class. And there was one kid in there who was a Christian fundamentalist who was so enraged. He started pounding the table, pounding the desk. He was really upset, and I called him out on it. I said, what are you so upset about? He said, Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, and that's all that matters. I said, oh, really? Well, since Christianity is less than 2,000 years old because Jesus was really Jewish um, and this is all man-made, what do you think happened to all the souls, the billions of souls that were on the planet before Jesus came along and the billions of souls that don't happen to be Christian on the planet now? You think they're going to be sent to hell because they're not Christian? Didn't have an answer. So sometimes if you just listen to somebody else's point of view, you can learn an awful lot. And that's what we're here for. Now, off camera is my very shy executive producer, and you will hear her voice periodically. Her name is Shawnee. And she will be asking some questions, and she's gotten some information uh, from the website. And if you just want to send a question, you send it to Metaspeak. I'm looking over here because I, I forget everything. Metaspeak.com on Facebook. And you type in your question and use your name, your first name. I don't need your second name, but I'd, I'd like your first name. Christian has been a wonderful contributor to all, a lot of our Metaphysically Speaking shows. And please keep sending in your questions, Christian. Have your friends do the same, because I know so many of you, even in the supermarket, a lady recognized me the other day. I had no makeup on. My hair was pulled back in a ponytail. I was humiliated. I had my sunglasses on, but still, and I said, how did you recognize me? She said, your voice, I can recognize your voice. We've been listening to you for years. So she said, I have a question about what happens when you die. I said, I have covered that a thousand times. She says, I know, but every time you explain it, I get something else out of it. So if we have time, I'm gonna mark this on my list, die, uh, I will explain that to you. And no, you don't perish and go to hell and you don't disappear. And there's no, what does somebody say on a TV show the other night? The drapes close down and you don't exist anymore. What would the point be? If an intelligent creator made this entire universe and is still making it and still making important changes, why would an intelligent creator that creates a pussycat, a puppy dog, a butterfly, beautiful flowers, a sunrise, a sunset, gravitational fields that keep the planets from bumping into each other. Why would that creator create a soul just to perish? Live maybe five minutes, live 50 years, live 90 years. That makes no sense. One of the things you learn about with metaphysics is that the more you know, the more you understand, and the more sense everything makes. The universe isn't a crapshoot. It isn't just here to make Christians or Jews or Muslims happy. It's here for our growth. It's here for our continued improvement. It's here for our going back home to the God force, which is the different levels of existence. If you're listening to me in front of your television, you're in a physical body. And that means we have lessons here on this physical planet. There are lots of other physical planets. Once upon a time, they used to think, oh, maybe there were maybe a hundred solar systems. They know now that they can't even count the solar systems. And they have planets which have people. And if you've had UFO experiences like I have and many others have, including 
almost every pilot I've ever counseled. I've counseled a lot of military people. They've had UFO experiences. And I can tell you that they don't look like little green men with cheese. They look like people. They're different looking. But we're different looking if you come from Ireland. You're different looking if you come from Nairobi. You're different looking if you come from Egypt. You're different looking if you come from Canada. So there are differences, but we're all still human souls. So we're going to be covering a lot of this. And remember, please send your emails to metaspeak.com and say, Linda, please answer this question. By the way, no question is too silly. Sometimes you may think it's silly, but there are many levels to the question that you might not be aware of. And I try to explain those things to you. Now, so I can clear some of this off, let's address your altar. It shouldn't be the kitchen table where you have dinner. It shouldn't be your desk where you do your paperwork for work. It shouldn't be where you do your schoolwork. It should be a separate part of your desk if you have to. It can be a little coffee table. This happens to be a little outdoor table set that I bought. Um, on the last day it was on sale, I got the last one, covered it with a tablecloth so it would look nice for the set, and you can use anything you want. An old card table from your grandmother would be just fine but put it in a place that is not gonna be bothered, where people are not gonna come home and throw their cell phone and their keys, and your kids aren't gonna drop their books on it, and you're not gonna throw coats. This is your sacred space. Why? Because again, what are we? We're souls having a human experience. So the soul is what continues throughout eternity. The soul is what was created by the creative force. And I don't care if you call it God, Allah, the light, the being, the existence, the perpetuity. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother is my favorite expression because God is both male and female and in perfection neither. And so therefore, this has to be your little sacred space. And if you live with other people, they have to honor that. And if you have to call a family meeting and say, nobody put anything on this table, Nobody can put anything on this desk or I'll be chasing around the house. Then make sure that you do that because you're having respect for yourself. And you're having respect for God. Because if you're part of that God force, then you deserve all the respect that God does. Remember the expression that your body is a temple? Great. It is a temple for your soul and somebody's going after my mic pack back here. <laughs> so Gracie, oh, who is that? So um, if you find that people are disrespecting your area, then you want to make sure that you don't have a cat that knocks things over. And you want to make sure that people respect you and you respect yourself. If you toss things on, yeah, go ahead and fix it or whatever you need to do. If you um, don't respect yourself, no one else is going to respect you. And if you don't respect your private space, no one else is going to respect you. So understand that you have to respect you because you're respecting God at the same time. Now, so your table can, you, you can have a little table. You can have a portion of your own desk that you set aside. You can have any area that's going to be quiet and special to you. And when you're going to sit and meditate, or even if you're working on a special project, you don't want the dogs barking, you don't want the TV blasting, you want things quiet. Or play some inspirational music. It could be classical music. It could be the channel on the TV that has the um, metaphysical sounds. I don't remember what they're called, and I don't know what they're called on your, on your set. But it's, it's not spiritual Christian stuff. It is, um, they want me to straighten my pearls because they're crooked, okay. Um, it is the kind of music that you would hear, Clanad on or Anya, um, Steve Halpern, those kinds of people. And that'd be playing in the background. Now, you're saying, Linda, you said you're a yogi and you can go to God in any way. So what are you doing up here with a nativity scene? What are you doing up here with a Buddha and Avalokiteshvara. Well, 
my altar is gigantic and I've got everybody on it. This nativity scene stays out all year. It's on my altar. I have another nativity scene. It's in my dining room. It stays out all year, surrounded by angels. And then at Christmas time, I put it on a big tray, surround it with greens and the angels and make it a centerpiece. You can love God in any way that you can begin to understand. I've always loved Buddha and Avalokiteshvara, or the Chinese say Kuan Yin. I happen to think they're different spirits, but I have no way of proving it. And you can put on your altar anything that's important. This is a lighted candle. You can purchase it from one of the shopping channels. And they come in three different styles. This one is with a little heart. This is also on my altar. It's also in my living room. This is a little bell. If you want a focal point before you start to meditate and you want to change the vibration, a little bell is very helpful. You can put on your crystals. These are electronic candles that you plug in. These are battery candles because I do not have any open flames in my house after almost burning it down years ago. You can have your crystals. You can have your prayer beads. Now, somebody stole, who would steal a pair of rosaries? But when we were closing an office and moving, somebody nabbed my rosaries. But I happen to have these, which is where rosaries, which are Christian, came from. And these are Buddhist prayer beads. I also have these, what are they I can't pronounce it. Cooley, not cool. I can't remember what they're called. It'll, you know when it'll come to me? Just as finished, when we're finished taping, it'll come to me. They're Hawaiian. Hawaiian nuts, actually. And these are shells. These are also from Hawaii. I have a special energy. Now, you can count them out. If you're Christian and you love the Hail Mary and the Our Father, you can count them out on the beads. You can do Om Mani Padme Om. You can do anything you want. This is your relationship with God. Don't follow somebody else's rules and regulations, people. You're going to be in for a fall because man-made ideas will always collapse. They come and go, but the universe perseveres. So what is this? This is called, and for you science people and physics people, you will recognize this. You've already recognized this and saying, what is she doing with a dodecahedron? One of my students laboriously put these together for our meditation class. Now, when you hold it so that these three pieces are in front of you, you will notice that you're looking at a six-pointed star. And I'm gonna try to do this backwards and upside down. I can't, okay. Here's the top, goes to the side, here's the bottom, and you'll see a six-pointed star. If you have it with a point out, it's a five-pointed star which means the human spirit, the head, the arms, the feet. That is the way to use a pentagram, a pentacle, a five-pointed star, not upside down. You say, well, I've seen it upside down. Well, I've seen a lot of things too, and that doesn't mean they're right. If you're practicing the black arts, you take everything that's positive and you reverse it. You take a rosary and hang it upside down. You take a five-pointed star and you hang that upside down. Five-pointed star is fine. It's bad people that are the problem. So the same if you draw the triangles upside down and right side up and the inside is there, that again is the creation of the Heavenly Father, Divine Mother. The inverted part is the male aspect of God. The like a bikini line is the female aspect of God. Inside is what they create together. You want to know what the Trinity is? Not the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. This is the Trinity right here. The Father, the Mother, the Child. Doesn't matter if it's male or female. That's your true Trinity. So I will remove this because that will give us a little more breathing space and I can answer some of your questions. Now, also you, what you want to have is some of your favorite uh, uh, postcards or artwork this one I love, it's angels surrounding the planet. 
I love that. I visualize that every single day when I meditate and when I pray. And I use this image all day long, especially if we're having a war situation or there was a shooting at a school, like another shooting at a school yesterday, or there's something going on on the planet I just don't feel is right. And plus, who couldn't use more blessings? So this planet, our planet, surrounded by angels, is a wonderful image for me. You'll notice over here is green Tara, and green Tara pre-exists to Buddhism. They used to think that green Tara was part of the healing energy, or the mother, or terra firma is the Latin term for the earth, and it comes from the expression Tara. And she is in charge of physical healing. And she has been very, very important in my life, especially with many crises. And there's also a white Tara, and she's in charge of compassion and gentleness and emotion. Also very special to me, and I will hold this here so you can see it, is the Archangel Michael. Now, this is a fabulous rendering of an artwork. I don't know who did it. I got it out of a magazine a million years ago. And the Archangel Michael is in charge of the fire principle on the planet and in charge of healing. And he has done wonderful, wonderful, wonderful work for many people, including me and many of my meditation students. So you want to make sure that you surround yourself with important things that have, I better put it over here, otherwise it's going to fall, that have importance to you. Now, I have the crop circles here, which I'm going to pluck off so you can see. This is from a website where you can find a million crop circles. There's a man in England who does the photography. No, I think he's in Canada. And he flies over there periodically. And for years, he has been taking photographs of crop circles. Now, why do I like crop circles? Well, because first of all, they're beautiful and symmetrical. You'll recognize the golden ratio right here. And these obviously are not man-made. These, in my prof uh, professional opinion, are a combination of two things. UFOs and the Earth Logos, which is the Earth Soul, working together to send messages. They've already interpreted many of these crop circles. They all have mathematical formulations. Those mathematical formulations, which are part of the universal conversation, have given us important information about the planet. So that's something you could have hanging around the place. These tiny little flags, which you may or may not see. I'm going to detach them. No. Nope. All right, these tiny little flags, if you can catch them, are Buddhist prayer flags. And they come from different monasteries with the Buddhist monks who write out prayers. And these prayers are put on these little pieces of cloth and they get hung. And the concept is as the breeze blows through them, the special prayers get sent out into the universe. And they can be about health, they can be about a community, they can be about an individual, they can be about world peace, and much of this is actually what is on these prayer flags. If you see a show about the Himalayas and you go up to Nepal or Tibet or Lhasa, you will see these flags blowing. And many of you said, what, what, are, what, are, what are those rags doing up in the air? They're not rags, they're prayers. And it doesn't matter to them that they get ragged because it's all made out of a very thin, cotton weave and they just blow and they recycle wherever they wind up. So you can put anything you want on your on your um, altar. I also have, oh I like this one too. I also have an angel holding a glowing earth. I just love that concept. A gigantic angel holding and protecting our earth. Not a bad thing to think about. Now you can also have pictures of loved ones and you can have pictures of, in my case, pussy cats. This was my giant pinky. He was a 22 pound Maine Coon. This was little <laughs> Princess Sweetie Pie. And she was quite a character and she would accompany me to the office every day and sit on her own chair. Here she is 
on her little couch at home with a little hat because she enjoyed wearing hats. I know you think I'm crazy. But nevertheless, you can have, should we mention the thunderstorm <laughs> that we're having? Because at home you may think, what in the world is going on? I could say God's talking to me, but I think that would be just a little presumptuous. This one here, the one whose tail you're seeing back and forth, this is her sleeping during our meditation class on her little chair that she happens to be on right now. And this is her when she's meditating along with us. You can also have pictures of creatures. I used to do volunteer work at a rehab center. This is really a snow leopard. This is really a snow leopard. How many of you can say that you've hugged a snow leopard or cleaned up vomit from a snow leopard because this was a very sick snow leopard and I did help take care of her and help restore her to health. So whatever is important to you, if you have a, if you have a picture of your children, if you have a picture of your great grandmother, if you have a picture of your best friend, if you have a picture of your spouse, uh, your dog, uh, your parrot, it doesn't matter. Whatever is important to you, that's what goes on the altar. The thing that happens is it gets very busy and very congested. So you wanna make sure that you keep things as neat and tidy as possible because congestion breeds kind of, you know, aggravation and you get lost and you think what's going on. The idea is to be able to focus and to be calm. And of course, ever present crystals. This was given to me by somebody very special. And this is moonstone, which I happen to love. This is tourmaline with calcite on it. This is a clear quartz double tourmaline, a double, uh, double crystal, double terminated. This is an amethyst, and this is black tourmaline. I'm gonna show you a really big piece of black tourmaline. Now, black tourmaline in crystal lore is supposed to protect us from people who are trying to harm us. So if you're at work, and you've got some adversaries, and you know who those adversaries are. A little tiny piece of black tourmaline is helpful, and often it's accompanied by calcite because it grows in the ground, and very often crystals will grow together. So it doesn't matter. You can have a plain table with nothing on it except a little candle. Please, I don't like flames. If it's in a flame, put it in a giant hurricane and make sure that you blow it out before you leave the table. Don't get up and go back. Extinguish it before you leave the table. That's it. You can have a paper or a notepad and a pen with you because you will get ideas. Maybe there are questions for yourself. Maybe there are concepts that you hadn't thought of in 25 years. Maybe there are images of things that happened to you when you were a child or something that happened at work today and you weren't quite sure about it, but now you're getting further clarification. Write it down or you'll forget it. I forget things. So there are notes all over my house and pads all over my house because I wanna make sure I forget it as little as possible. Now, what you're gonna do, very simply, sit up straight. Palms open either on the table or on your lap, which is much more comfortable. You're gonna be focusing right here above the nose, not way up here, right here above the nose between the eyebrows. And silently, if you're Christian and you're not comfortable with this yet, you can say amen, which comes from om. And then you can say om mani padmi om, which means father, mother, God. And so very simply, or you can recite the Hail Mary, or you can say, God, please help me. God, please help me. God, please help me. Quietly, over and over, with your eyes closed to yourself, even if you start for five minutes, you'll build up. It's that simple. You don't need to go to $500 a day classes to learn. I just taught you. Try not to have music on unless you have a lot of background sounds outside. People are mowing the lawns and thunderstorms and all kinds of things. You don't want to have that kind of distraction. So you can very quietly have on some very peaceful music. Eventually, you'll tune out. And the idea to go without is to go within. You're going into your third eye. 
that is where you get images of things. When I do consultations for people, it's like a movie screen or a TV screen gets turned on. And I can see what we're talking about. So therefore, meditation is very simple. It's reserving the time. I want you to promise yourself that you're going to take five minutes a day, just five minutes a day if you're a new starter. Five minutes a day, that's all. The best time to do it is the time that you are more relaxed and you're not going to be watching your watch and saying, oh, I have to dash, I have to dash. What good is that? Just spend five minutes. Five minutes. Then you'll build up to 10 minutes. Then you'll build up to 15. And by the way, sometimes people think, oh, the longer your meditation, the better it'll be. Here's a surprise. I cannot tell you how many times I've done everything right. The phones are turned off, everything's turned off, I've had my shower, the cat's been fed, everything's great, I'm gonna sit down, I'm gonna have a great meditation. No, I don't. No, 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 doesn't happen. And other times I think, oh, I've only got 15 minutes, sit down, I have a fabulous meditation. We don't make the rules. What did somebody say? We make plans and God laughs. So. It's what your consciousness, your soul is ready for at any particular moment and what your soul is capable of experiencing. So don't worry if it's five minutes or 15 minutes or five hours. It's whatever happens. And when you do your, your meditations, meditation is when God talks to you, prayer is when you talk to God. So please do me and everybody else a favor. Ask God and the angels to bless the planet. Ask God and the angels to transform the minds of cruel people into kindness. Ask for things to be better on the planet. As in heaven, so is earth. That's all. Okay, now let's go to some questions. Because I know that people have been sending me things and they're saying, well, you don't answer my question. And you can contact us at metaspeak.com on the blog. Uh, blog Talk Radio, Facebook, YouTube, and Straighten My Pearls, which I took them off because they were a nuisance. So if you think, oh gosh, wasn't she wearing pearls before? The cat didn't get them, I took them off. Sometimes you just have to make things easy, and um, I believe as easy as possible. Okay, what's reincarnation? Here's the secret. Are you ready? Even the Catholic Church used to teach reincarnation. Yeah, it used to be part of the doctrine. You know when it stopped? When Constantine decided, along with the other men, because Jesus brought the male-female energy back to the planet, because that's what his mother and father were. They were priests and priestesses in the temple of Jerusalem. If you're Catholic, you know that people who join the monastery or people who join the brotherhood or people who become nuns or priests take saints' names. So Mary or Marie or Martha were variations of the term mère, which in French is M-A-R-E, with a little, I think, accent d'aigu at the end, which means the ocean. And life came out of the ocean. So many women who were special spiritual aspirants took that name. Joseph, same thing. They didn't have the name Joseph back in Israel at that time. So we know that they were priests and priestesses. When I do my Christmas show again for you, I'll explain more. But Jesus' name was Yeshua. And so there was no Christianity. Christianity is not even mentioned in the Bible. When I say that to people, they go, oh, it must be there somewhere. I say, please do find it for me and point it out. Because I've read the Bible and I know it's not there. So reincarnation is the understanding or the principle that your soul gets split out from the God force. Why? Just to see what you're going to do with your free will. I've always said free will is God's curse against humanity. But if you say, God, I'm happy being with you. I don't have any questions. I don't want to go anywhere. Bop! You're back home again. Instantaneously. But if you're looking around, you're saying, Ooh, what's that blue thing over there? What's that star doing? You have now created the need to find out. And so your soul will just, like a giant wad of chewing gum, 
move a little bit over here so you can see what the blue thing is or the light is or whatever that is. And if you're totally convinced that you're satisfied that this really isn't where you want to be, you want to be home again, then boom, you're back home again. However, if you say, but what happens if I go over here? Well, now you stretch that little piece of gum further and further from the main giant wad of chewing gum in the universe, which is the God Force and all the souls. And so you create the need to find that art. And you will be in the body that you need to find that art. That's reincarnation. It's the cycle of physical life, physical death, soul, and perpetuity. You get the experience you need, either because it's karmic, because you did something that needs to be attended to, or you've developed a special talent and you'll use that talent to good. Perhaps you're a wonderful teacher. Perhaps you're a good doctor. Perhaps you're great with numbers and you're a good accountant and you can help people with their finances. Perhaps you're a wonderful nurse. Perhaps you're a fabulous veterinarian. Perhaps you decide you want to be a pussycat. I can't tell you how many of my friends said they want to come back as my cat because I love cats and I've always taken very good care of them. And how you treat your pets determines the type of soul you are. If you treat your pets cruelly or carelessly, I can promise you we will not be meeting in the heavens. You'll be somewhere else and it won't be really pleasant. So reincarnation is the cycle of physical life and physical death with the soul in perpetuity. That's all. Now, we were talking about the fact that I said to the girl at the vets yesterday, that the parrot may very well be a human soul experiencing a parrot body. And she said, I never thought of it like that, but it makes perfect sense. Because I'll say things and he'll respond to them just like he's trying to talk to me and give me an answer. I said, of course. And parrots are smart anyway. This is a gray, the African grays, and they're very smart. Where They have a vocabulary of over 500 words or something like that. Cats are smart. Dogs are smart. All animals can see your aura, which is your soul, and your aura changes colors. So don't let anybody tell you, oh, I see a green light here, so that means you have a healthy heart, because there's more than one color. It means they've read a book and they think they can interpret you. Run the other way. You're filled with light with different color variations. Your thoughts change your colors. Like your thoughts can change your blood pressure. You can take your blood pressure 10 times in 15, 20 minutes, and it'll be 10 different readings, depending upon the thoughts that are going through your mind, depending upon the emotions. Have you just seen something very upsetting on television? Has your dog been barking at a bunny rabbit outside, and that's upset you? Changes your blood pressure changes the colors in your aura. So reincarnation is the understanding that we are all part of a major force field. If you want to call it God, that's great. And that our goal is to go home again. And we're having these physical experiences because they're teaching us lessons or they're helping us use our talents and abilities to help others. Doesn't matter if you help animals, doesn't matter if you help humans or you decide to be a botanist or a researcher. However you use your talents and abilities that fits your personality and fits those abilities, that's a good use of a life. Some people say to me, well, I have a friend, they never get a pimple, they never have a physical problem, they never uh, have money problems, they live in a gorgeous house, everything's great. They're living what's called a rest life. The universe knows that physical lifetimes are very difficult. So every seven lifetimes, you get a rest lifetime where you're gorgeous and you're tall and you're healthy and you have a fabulous marriage and you have these fabulous children, you live in a fabulous neighborhood, fabulous house, everything's great. Enjoy it while it lasts because in your next lifetime, you'll resume your problems. And the dying situation, there's no soul death. I personally have had about 12 or 13 physical near-death experiences. 
I've told a couple of doctors this, and they've looked at me cross-eyed, and I've told some others, and I had the privilege of telling my family physician when I was a little girl, when I was 14, um, about a death experience I just had in the hospital. And I looked at him, and I knew he was dying, and he was, to me, a saint, Dr. David Schoenbraun. And when I died with the measles, he came to my house, and he was crying at my bedside. And when I told him this, after I recovered, he said, you were dead. You couldn't have seen this. I said, I can tell you where the car was parked. You parked under the light in the front. And you had your pajamas on underneath your pants. And they were white and blue stripes. He said, you were dead. You couldn't know this. Well, I wasn't dead. Or I was dead, but I was still watching him because I was there in my physical body or just hovering over the bed. As I was hovering over the bed when I knew his car was coming, and I watched for it, and there it was, and he was walking very sad, crying, up the front step because he took all of his patients very seriously, and he was a wonderful man. And so when he knew he was dying, he asked me to explain my near-death experiences. And I had the privilege of being able to lighten the burden. He was raised Jewish. He didn't study the Kabbalah. The Kabbalah teaches reincarnation, too. I have some disagreements with some of their interpretations of it, but they understand there's no such thing as death. Everything you think, everything you do, everything you say matters. It's either building a healthy foundation or it's building one that's going to come crashing down, usually on others before it crashes on you. Harry Belafonte had a song years ago, House Built on a Weak Foundation Will Not Stand. So if you build your life on a weak foundation, it's not going to work out for you. It's going to be very sad. And there are people who need you. You were born on this planet to improve your own life as well as the lives of others. So there is no such thing as soul death. Now, when we're finished taping, I'm going to go change my clothes, and I'm still the same person. I'm just changing my outfits. So when you die physically, you've dropped that outfit. You've taken off the tuxedo. You've taken off the dress. You've taken off the jeans. And now you're free of all that. And you're going to take a body that's going to be appropriate for your next lifetime. Why would you take a body on a planet that doesn't have six arms? You'd wait till you got to a planet that had six arms. It doesn't make any sense. You take a body that's appropriate to you. And what about people who are born crippled? People who die early? Well, let's address the people who die early first. Sometimes a soul is just meant to experience life, taking a breath on the planet. And the parents think they failed, and they're giving themselves all kinds of heartaches and many marriages break up when there's a miscarriage or the baby dies shortly after they're blaming each other they can't deal with the guilt well it has nothing to do with them they were just helping the soul come to the physical plane it's the physical soul's karma and it's their karma too to be able to have the opportunity to experience this life even just for five minutes the soul decided it wasn't ready, or all it needed was five minutes, and that's all it took. So therefore, when you are thinking about, oh, I'm being punished because my child died, you're not being punished. The child's not being punished. Nobody's being punished. It was that experience. Why do some people live to be 100? That's the experience they need. They're not being rewarded. I don't ever want to reach 100. I want to live a healthy, vibrant, productive life. And so therefore, you're not being punished when you die early. If you're born with some type of deformity or you have some type of accident where you lose a limb, that is because perhaps in your last lifetime, you didn't take care of your health. You were careless. Maybe you drove a car carelessly slammed into a tree and killed a whole family of other people. Well, you're going to have to pay for that. And you're going to have to experience the same kind of 
tragedy and sadness and loss of physical capabilities that the person did who you hurt in that last lifetime. Sometimes it happens in this lifetime. Sometimes people like Michael J. Fox and Christopher Reeves, who had terrible physical ailments, and Michael J. Fox is still with us, fortunately, he has Parkinson's, are born knowing they have that karma because they're going to be living with dignity, with a disease that is treatable, not curable. Christopher Reeves fell off a horse. Well, I used to horseback ride, and I'm gonna tell you, you're riding an animal that's a quarter of a ton. That thing falls on you, you're in trouble. So when you do certain things in life, like skydive, which is crazy to me, anybody who jumps out of a perfectly good plane needs their heads examined, in my opinion. It's also risking the body you've been given. So if you engage in dangerous behavior, you cannot be surprised when a bad thing happens. If you're engaging in normal behavior, walking to school, and a bus hits you, that is a karmic situation because perhaps you hit another child either earlier in this lifetime or in another lifetime. It's not get even. It's balancing the karma, the scales of justice. It's one of my favorite symbols. The scales of justice balancing each side so that each side now is completely even and balanced and harmonious. That's what reincarnation, that's what life is all about. Balancing your own scales of justice. So if you have an early death, and like the question that I received is why do babies die? Because they're individual souls, just like you're an individual soul, and I'm an individual soul, and my producer's an individual soul, and my camera producer's an individual soul. We all are individual souls on our own journey. And we meet up with people we've known from other lifetimes. Some are friends, some are enemies, some are neutrals. Because if you didn't have the neutrals, you'd be so busy running around with the friends and the enemies, you would, it would be like one of those housewife shows with this drama every second, and everybody's fighting with everybody else. I, I, I thought those shows were interesting to begin with. I don't watch them anymore. I, I don't need that kind of drama. I don't live with that kind of drama. But there are people who thrive on it. Bless their little black hearts. They're not happy people. I'm not singling out anybody on any particular show. I'm just saying, you need people as spacers so that the people you get along with and the people you don't get along with aren't constantly congested together. You get an opportunity to experience both. I do not like the following expression. I've worked with many psychologists and two psychiatrists over the years where I refer people back and forth. Their expression is, if you don't like somebody, what you don't like about that person, you have in your own personality. Well, that's not true. I don't like drinkers. I don't drink. I don't care for people who do drugs. I don't do drugs, never have. I came from two alcoholics. I did not want to be like them. So I made sure that I wasn't. I don't smoke. In fact, I can't even be around smoke. I'm so highly sensitive to it, I can't breathe. So if you don't like something about someone, you can examine it. Maybe that is a problem that you have. Maybe it's a problem you grew up with. Maybe it's a health problem. Maybe it's a safety problem. If you've got somebody who drives too fast all the time and you don't, you don't have that problem. You just want to be safe and get out of the car alive. So before you believe these psychological platitudes, think for yourself. Take it into meditation, review it, and get to know yourself better. And if there's something about yourself you don't like, you can fix it. Even if you have to go for therapy, what's wrong with therapy? If you have to go to a psychic, we have insight that perhaps you don't have, or perhaps we can confirm something for you. So. We covered the reincarnation. Why do babies die? Because they're the same as adults. They're the souls. They're their own souls on their own mission, on their own journey. And that's part of their journey. 
maybe in the next lifetime. They could be born tomorrow to somebody else and maybe live 10 minutes. They're getting the feeling of being on a physical planet because maybe they've never been on a physical planet before. And when you're on a physical planet, one of the things you also do is experience different forms of life. You can be a human soul inhabiting a rock for five minutes or five hours because you want to get that experience. You can be a human soul inhabiting a pussycat, a parrot, a tiger, a snow leopard, because it's an experience you need to have to understand life on the planet. You can be in a giant sequoia for five years if you like it, and you learn about birds, and you learn about nature, and you learn about bugs, and the part they play in the whole ecology. But you're still a human spirit. Like if you put on a tuxedo or a formal, it's still you. If you put on a pair of jeans or a bathing suit, it's still you. You just need a different costume. So here's another question people always have. Why don't I know my guardian angel and what's my guardian angel's name? They don't have names. Not that we could pronounce. No one is called Mary or Susan or John. Trust me on this. They have names that are universal in their thought and their breath. Sanskrit, which is the oldest language found on the planet, which is similar to the language that we spoke in Atlantis, although we were multilingual on Atlantis. And if you're saying, oh, where's Atlantis and how come we don't find it? Well, we have found parts of it off Cuba, off Bimini, off Ireland, in the Mediterranean, in the Atlantic Ocean, in the Pacific. So therefore, we spoke different languages, but Sanskrit is a language of breath, of vibration, of sound, of thought. Same with ancient Egyptian. Ancient Egyptian is not the language that is spoken today. It's not the language that was spoken in the last 3,000 years because it's with breath and sound and thought. Because every sound either creates which can be annoying or it can create a bell. And it has a different meaning. It has a different color. It has a different vibration, which is how we used to do healing. So think about your environment. Think about what you bring to you. Think about the type of sounds and music you listen to. Are you listening to rap, which I personally do not like, or the ghetto music? What are they calling it? Street beat or something like that? I like classical. I like country western, except for the lion dying, cyan and crying stuff. I like um, just regular standards. I don't like stuff that's loud and cacophonous and irritating. And let me tell you, I was talking to a woman the other day, and I was talking about, my, I was going through my purse, and I pulled out earplugs. She said, what are those for? I said, when I go to the movies, I have to wear earplugs. She said, you do? Why? I said, because I'll go deaf. You don't wear earplugs? She said, no. Talked about someone who's been to too many concerts. Your hearing is very delicate. Protect it. So even background sound that maybe your neighbor is playing can be really irritating. And you can be out there gardening and be hearing this irritating music in the background and find you're feeling lousy or you're feeling nauseous or you're not too happy. That's because you're hearing these sounds and they play an important part in your personal well-being. So to surround yourself with loveliness, you don't have to have a lot of money. Get plants. You can see I've got a garden here. It all started out with one plant with three half dead leaves. And I have generated these plants into millions and given them away. You can buy the little plants for 99 cents at the supermarket. Surround yourself with loveliness. Understand that you're not being punished when you die. That's my cat. You're not being punished when you die. It's your opportunity to get a rest. And it's a baby's opportunity to experience the planet maybe for the first time. And you're providing that opportunity. It's not anything awful when you cross over. 
It's welcoming and loving and kind and caring. Unless you've been a cruel person, you're going to have a very different experience. Now, I don't know if I can get to, oh, the guardian angels, well, let me cover that for one second. They don't have names, but every soul, when it's split out from the God force, is assigned a guardian angel. Is the guardian angel better than the healing angels? Are the healing angels better than the angels that watch out for animals? Are the angels that watch out for planets better? No, there is no jealousy. There's no, I'm better than you are in the astral world and in the universe. It's just their job. They get assigned to your soul throughout eternity until you finally go back home to the God force. You may have more than one, and you may get assigned special angels for special projects. Doctors, for instance, who are performing surgery have told me that they have felt presences surrounding them and they felt light and happy and joyous and guiding and firm and comforting and that they knew they were doing the right thing. I said, well, those are the angels of healing. Those are the angels that have been assigned to you for this particular patient. So you will not know your guardian angel's name. They don't want you to know the name. They don't care if you call them boobly boo. It doesn't matter to them. Just as long as you respect that guardian angel and you know that the guardian angel is there to protect you. Now, wouldn't it be great if we all listened to what our guardian angel said? Because sometimes they try desperately to warn us and we don't listen. That's part of being a human, it's part of being silly, and it's part of thinking that this is the physical body, because it's the physical body, but once it goes, it goes. But the soul continues. So, we've answered a bunch of questions. How much more time do we have? We've got three more minutes. Oh, goody. You will be able to find us on Facebook, and you type in metaspeak.com, M-E-T-A-S-P-E-A-K.com, and you will find us on Facebook, you will find us on YouTube. You can find us on Blog Talk Radio. And you will find this show in Sarasota, Florida, on television. And you can also type in Linda Bennett. That is my cat whacking the tablecloth, wanting attention. And you can also type in Metaphysically Speaking. I am Linda Bennett. And this is a concept I brought to television and radio many, many years ago. It is trademarked, by the way. And it is something that is very important to me because being able to share truth and light is very important to me. That's my cat knocking over the poster. So having pussy cat, oh, by the way, when you meditate, don't try to keep the dog or the cat out because they want to be with your good energy. They'll curl up on your feet. She sleeps right behind me on my chair and puts her little head on my shoulder and goes right to sleep as I'm meditating. Why wouldn't a cat or a dog want good energy? Why wouldn't you want good energy? This may, by the way, change some of the people you hang out with. Not bad. If they're not people you'd want to be on a desert island with, studying important things, if she knocks anything down, I, <laughs> I'm going to be really cranky. If that's not a person you'd want to be on a desert island with for 10 years, then maybe that's not a good friend to have. Think about that. Desert island, roughing it, catching crabs to eat, watching those giant spiders that are on coconut trees. You want to have the very best environment you can possibly have. And so you want to surround yourself with people who are just as interested in you and kindness and goodness as you are in them and other forms of life. And if you just remember to open up your hearts and minds to God's universal truth, you will know that God and the angels are always with you. Linda Bennett, Metaphysically Speaking.